did a bit of stuff on last week. Last week we were focusing on defense, so how to survive underneath and how to get out. So for people who weren't there last week, I'll just really quickly run through the stuff that we did, um, just so you're aware of it. And I would encourage you to come to me or come to someone like Jara and ask them about in-depth explanations for the escapes, uh, if you want to know more. For the time being, I'll just do a real quick rundown so you can see that there are options. It's not hopeless being underneath uh, a scarf because it is a very nasty position and, and it can feel sometimes hopeless being underneath that. So, Jara has four main escape option options available to him depending on what I give him. If I push my weight too far over him, he can roll me. If I stick my head too far up, he can push on me and kick me down. If I put too much space between my hip and his shoulder, he can get that elbow, his elbow, and get his elbow to the mat and he can take my back. And the fourth thing is that if he has a body lock on me, and I try and reach that out, he can get his hand, and he can kick, and break me down. So, that's what we did last week, and we're not gonna spend too much time on it tonight. We're doing uh, how to control it, how to make it nice and nasty, and a couple of submissions from there as well. But uh, I do encourage you to look into those if you haven't learned them already, because they're, they're good, you kind of need to know them after, especially after everyone's gonna learn how to tap from here. Cool, so. The thing that people associate scaffold with the most, I would say, is your ability to transfer weight into your opponent. And that's with good reason. I can't really think of another position apart from maybe knee on belly where you can transfer so much pressure into your opponent's sternum. Um, it, I'm not sure if it looks particularly nasty, but right now, I mean, most of my weight is going through my ribs, right into Jarrah's sternum. Or if I come lower, I can bring it into his stomach. I can lift him. I can pull on his arm and lift him, and make it really nasty. If I wanted to go to a high scarf, I can crush his head and his arm together, and still be nice and nasty and heavy. It is a heavy, uncomfortable position. But what people don't realize about scarfold is that it's also very, very mobile. And that mobility, more so in my opinion than the pressure, is what you need to be aware of if you want to keep the position. Because if I'm just heavy and I'm just holding down and making it nasty and my only focus is making it nasty, Jarrah's going to be quick. And when Jarrah is quick, even if I beat this first move, maybe I'll go to my pressure and he rolls me. Maybe Jarrah tries to roll me and I just tighten up but then he gets his elbow to the mat, right? When you are in this position, you need to be able to adapt to what your opponent feeds you, right? So Jarrah's going to just give me a little bit of pressure doing whatever he wants. And what you see is that you're moving your legs a lot, controlling your posture. If Jarrah wanted to push on my head, I need to tuck down and fight that. If Jarrah walks up to my hips, I'm always walking away from him so he doesn't get to my legs. Controlling my weight instead of just pressuring it in. And then when I see an opportunity, when he calms down a bit, then I can make it heavy. Now this is a lot of information, and it's okay if you guys don't remember this. The key takeaway from this first bit is that you need to stay mobile with it. Because if you're not mobile with it, if you're just buffering down, they're going to get out. So, uh, does everybody know how to get into the position, or do we want to go over that real quick? Just a decent entry. Real quick? Cool, okay. So here's what we're going to do. We'll start from the regular side control position. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my right side arm, and I'm going to feed it from Jarrah's underhook to the side of his neck, right here. Then I'm going to switch my hips. So right now I have my hips sort of facing in a, a regular position. When I switch them, I switch where my legs are. Like this. So it's sort of a step out. So, um, step out. As I step out, this arm is going to go from underneath his head and it's just going to slide up his shoulder 
and to his elbow. Okay, and I'm just gonna hold that elbow. Here, on the head, switching hips, and as I switch hips, I grab the elbow. Now the last thing you need to do is kick your back leg into his armpit and reach around his, the back of his head and grabbing on the shoulder or grabbing on the leg. So doing over that one more time. We post next to the head. We switch the hips and we bring the close arm to his elbow. I kick up into his hips and I grab on his shoulder or on my own leg. Do you guys want to give that a shot real quick? Cool. Yeah, the first thing I wanted to go over is just the general control principles. So, so far the main takeaways is that you want to stay mobile. And we've just done getting into that position. So there's a couple more things I want to go over, just defending from some of those basic escapes, right? The main escape people usually hit on you is this roll, where Jared grabs around my waist and he throws me back. There's a very clear reason why this would work or why this wouldn't work, and that is where my weight is distributed on my opponent. If you think of there being a line dividing Jarrah right down the center, I want my weight either sitting on that line or on this side of the line where my legs are. Right? If I'm heavy on my butt, this is still a good position, but it's not a lot of pressure on my opponent. When you're heavy on the side, you can control the elbow a little bit more. Right? There's no way this elbow is getting out from me. When I'm heavy on my opponent's body, it wears him out really quick, and it sucks. And you can usually bait escape, you can uh, bait submissions from here. But when I'm here, when I'm putting weight through, I'm making sure that I'm not leaning too far over the other. Because when I lean too far to this side of his body, this is where it makes moving me around as well very, very easy. I don't want this to happen, because that's where the escape happens. So when you hit this position, Make sure you know where your weight is at all times. If it's off to the side of them, the side, that's fine. If it's through their center line, that's good. But if it's, you're leaning over here, you don't want this. And you might find yourself accidentally leaning over there when Jarrah tries to turn like this. When he turns into me to get an elbow escape, you're gonna be correcting that by driving into him. See what happens? Not good. So make sure at all times when he's when he's trying to get out and you're defending, you're correcting your weight, but you're not over-correcting your weight. And Jared is pretty wrong. He could be baiting. Right? He could certainly be baiting. Yeah, and that is one of the the main ways that people get out of scaffold is that they fake one thing and then they'll go for the other. He fakes the elbow escape. I drive into him, and suddenly I'm gone. He can do it the other way around as well. He can try and roll. I can correct by pushing my weight down onto my hips. Huge uh, gap here for the elbow. Uh, is everyone, is that all right so far? So we're making sure we know where our weight is at all times. Uh, adding to that, if I am leaning off the side of Jarrah, and one reason I may want to lean off the side of Jarrah is if Jarrah is a lot heavier than me. If I'm versing somebody that's 120 kilos, it doesn't matter if I put a lot of weight into them, they're gonna take every little bit, um, every little opportunity I give them to roll me, and it's just gonna be so much easier for them. When you're against a heavy person and you're leaning off to the side like this, it's just so much heavier because your center of gravity is all the way over here instead of all the way over here. And so that is one reason why you might take your weight off of them. Although always be aware that the further you go to this side, the easier it is for the elbow to get out. So we'll do uh, a quick drill. Uh, actually, I'll show you a couple more things first. Um, everyone's, everyone's following so far, that's kind of all good. The last two things you want to be aware of is where your posture is and what your free elbow is doing. We're taught a lot in Jiu-Jitsu that you want to have high posture, right? You want to be up, right? A lot of the time when you're in guard, you have high posture. When you're on mount, good posture. It's a little different for scaffold. When you're in scaffold, the higher you keep your posture, the easier it is for you to get pushed back. Right? That makes it that no escape. So when I'm in scaffold, what I'm actually doing is crunching forward. Right. If you go ear to ear, that's good. Not really necessary. You just need to make sure you're not pushing all the way back. Right? You're making it difficult for him to push your weight back. Even if Jared gets on top of my face like this, it's not really strong because I'm already crunched down. Right? So that kills his ability to escape backwards with his legs. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Cool. 
And the last thing, the fourth thing is that if you want to be aware of what this elbow is doing. A lot of people will do all those things great. They've got that weight distributed well, they're crunching down, but then their opponent has a body lock and they want to fish that out. And the way they fish it out is by leaning back with their wrists and then suddenly they get caught. All right? You don't want that. That sucks. So what we do instead is whenever our opponent has a body lock and we're trying to fish for these arms, you lead with your elbow instead of your wrist. So you keep your elbow tight to your body, drag it back. All right? I can feel now with the, with the pointy bit of my elbow that I'm on Jared's wrists. You can break wrists, uh, not break wrists, you can break grips very efficiently by using that elbow. When you combine that with a little bit of pressure to distract them, bring your elbow back, hit the wrists, and you just drive into it. That's broken now. You can feed it forward, and now you've got this arm to build a submission off of over real quick. So, uh, we're going to do a drill for a couple minutes. Your opponent is going to be underneath and they're just going to be feeding you different kinds of pressure. They might push on you, they might try and roll into you, they might try and roll away from you, roll you forward, they might try and walk around you. And really the specifics of what they're doing isn't too important right now. As the person on bottom, try and figure out what mobility you have available to you. Can you put your head, your hands in front of their head? Can you lift your legs up to get around their head? Can you turn on your side to alleviate some pressure? As the person on the bottom, just try and feel out what you have available to you. And if you can build up an escape from there, then do that. Uh, but don't, don't do, go too crazy with it, just do like 30, 40%. The person on top is going to be feeling those reactions and trying to assess what they should be doing to prevent those escapes. I know that if Jared tries to roll me in this direction, I go heavy on my butt. If Jared tries to roll into me, I drive into him, being aware that I don't want my way too far to the side. If he pushes me forward, I've got my leg in front of me to prevent that. And if he tries to push on my head, I can come down low and break those grips. How does that sound to everybody? So we'll do a couple minutes and then we'll switch around to a couple more minutes. Sound good? Yeah. <laughs> How is that? Did everyone sort of understand the position a little bit? Um, does anybody have any questions at, at this point? Um, so when you're doing the scarf hold, does it match where you have your upright leg? It does, yeah. So there is a super secret fifth escape that I haven't brought up just yet because I don't want to uh, give too much information. It will just we will forget it, but if I if I let this this high high leg trail back, right? Jara, if he has enough mobility, can hook it. And if he hooks it, he can work his way around to my back and he can get out just as easily. So what this leg is doing is following your opponent. Jarrah's gonna keep walking into me because he wants his hip to be close to my hips. It helps him escape. This leg is watching those legs and walking away from him. This leg is also the leg that allows you to transfer pressure. Whenever I decide to get heavy, I press on this leg and my butt comes off the ground. Now Jaro is suffering. Jaro is not suffering. We are walking around. I want Jaro to suffer. Push on the leg, butt comes up, Jaro suffers. So that's what that leg do is doing. This leg is just sort of sticking out in front of you so that if he tries to roll you uh, from the front, this leg prevents that. Yeah, goes, stops it. Um, sound good? Cool. Any more questions? Amazing. Let's do a couple of submissions. Um, yeah. So uh, there are there are a lot of submissions actually. Uh, we're going to do two tonight. But just so you're aware of what is there, you can do straight arm bars. Or you can shoot your hips up. You can do kimuras, you can do head and arm chokes, you can do super nasty Ezekiel things. If you bring the other arm into it, there's a whole nother range of arm bars that you can do. Kimuras. Uh, it's, it's quite versatile really, but I'm going to show you the two I use the most. And pretty much every time I get a submission really, like I, I am hunting for these two. And those two are the kimura and the head and arm check. So, 
that leg from where you just showed. Yeah. yeah it's, it's lovely, I love it. I was going to ask you to It's do great, it. yeah. yeah. Um, it's cool because you're like, you're using your legs, it just looks, it gets style points that one. Um, we're going to assume that our opponent has a body lock on us when we start these because this is the number one defense that your opponent is going to do. They're going to have their arms back here. And as we know, if we put our wrists back to break the, break the wrists, he's going to get out, right? So we're going to start here. We're going to break his wrists free by leading with our elbow driving into his wrists and pushing down, which creates a little space where your elbow can get through. Then using your elbow still, you're gonna roll his arm forward. And once it's in front of you here, you can catch with the wrist. All right? So body lock, leading with the elbow, grinding up onto the wrist. You wanna just scoot to the side so it's gonna sit here. Sorry. Cool. Leading with the elbow, grinding up to the wrist, pushing down. Wrists come loose. You can, once it's open like this, you can bring your wrist, uh, your elbow further back if you need to grab it. But just keep in mind that you're always moving your elbow across your body, so there's never space, right? But you might be able to just fish it out with the elbow. That's fine. Fishing out with the wrist, fine as well. The key point when you're fishing wrists is that you are stuck to your body. You're not giving space. And we've got the wrist. Amazing, this is great for us. So we're gonna do that Kimura. The way that you do the Kimura is actually quite simple, to be honest. You grab the wrist, you put it underneath your leg. Now this can come on very quickly, so just please be careful with your opponent's poor shoulders. But we're gonna bring it under the leg, right at the, like the knee bit, right? And then squeeze it shut. You can bring your far leg and you can sort of lock them together, like that. So this one crunches, this one comes on top, locks everything nice and tight. Jared, can you get your arm out of that? Are you locked to? Because he's pinching his, uh, like doing like a hamstring curl, it's yeah. my hand sort of stuck like a vice. Yeah, sweet. If they are particularly annoying with it, sometimes I might even feed the wrist to my head arm. The arm around his head like this, and then it's like he's certainly not getting out of it. But I find that most of the time, it's once you're here, it's pretty much done for, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, that that happens. Like before, I even need to properly put it on. I find that I get it here, and a lot of people will tap because this is a lot of pressure still. So anyway, grab the wrist under the leg, squeeze it, squeeze it with both legs. Now, what we're going to do to finish it is you're going to get an S grip around his head and again please be nice to your partners this can get quite nasty it can be if you want to be mean with it what you're going to do is you're going to push your hips back you're basically extending your back right so if i didn't have jarrah's head what i'm going to do is i'm going to lift on the head and i'm going to push the hips back you don't need to go that far because i'll tap so s grip on the head i'm going to bring his head up and i'm kicking my legs and already he's tapping right and if we think about it from a mechanical perspective, what's happening is I'm turning Jarrah's spine, which makes him weak and makes it, it builds more tension sort of on his shoulders and his neck, which makes it seem nasty. And then because I'm kicking down, but his elbow is stuck, it turns like a kimura. Right? So let's go over that all one more time. Using my elbow, I'm going to drag across my body until I get to Jarrah's wrists, and then I'm going to crunch down and fish that space out. Grab the wrist and you put it under your leg. You just make your leg nice and tight and then you can sit over with your far leg. You get an S grip around the head and then you bring your chest up as you bring your knees further away from you. And Jarrah taps. Uh, any questions so far? Awesome. Let's give that one a crack. And, uh, if so far. It can be kind of funny to get the little details down sometimes. So, the second one is the head and arm choke. Now, with this head and arm choke, you can, you can spend a lot of time talking about head and arm choke techniques. Like, there are some little details that make this very powerful or very weak, which we probably won't have time to cover everything of today. So, if you find that you can't put the choke on for this one, uh, come see me afterwards and I'll give you some little pointers or I would encourage you to go and research it 
online as well, because this is it's like a whole another topic to be honest. The head and arm trick is a big thing. Anyway, what we're going to do. Sometimes if Jared just chooses not to start with the body lock, he might choose to start by pushing on me, right? If my posture is back, he can kick me. That's bad. If my posture is forwards, he can't kick me, but he's still going to try to. What I can do instead is actually capitalize on this mistake of his. If by pushing on his elbow, I can shoot his arm across his center line and get my neck below his elbow. Right now, Jara can't get that arm back because I'm, I'm below his elbow. It's, it's just kind of stuck, right? He's pushing on me quite quick. You're gonna push the elbow across and then sink down. What you're gonna do from there is you're going to get Jarrah's head or your opponent's head and you're just going to push it into your far elbow a little bit. The way that the head and arm shake works is that his arm blocks off his blood supply on this side and your other arm blocks off the blood supply on the other side of his head. But if your arm is loose, so if I exaggerate and I make lots of space right here, he's never going to get choked on that side and he's not going to tap. Right? So you need to clear that, you need to close this space here up first for an effective choke. So once you've gone across the elbow and you've blocked um, down here, you sort of get their head and you just nice and gently close the space here. Here, get the head, and push everything together nice and tight. Then what you do is you get your hands together in an S grip and you sink your weight down to the ground. Right? So my ear is basically where Jarrah's ear is. And then, uh, to finish it off, you're going to turn your head into your opponent's head and you're just going to walk around the side into the attack. Uh, this, this is kind of, it's not a comfortable choke, but it's not like a guillotine where everything is crushing on your neck and it sucks. So you might find that sometimes people take a little bit of time to tap with this one. Doesn't mean it's not working. I give it 10 seconds or so, and if they still haven't tapped, then you can try sitting back up and correcting. Pushing the head into your arm, sinking down, walking your head up, and walking the ground. How does that sound for everybody? Does it sound good? Awesome. Let's give that one a crack real quick. Now, I. I did not get this one on my first night. It took me months before I figured out how to do a good, consistent head and arm choke. And I hope that you guys were all able to get some taps from us tonight. If not, uh, please send me after the class and I'll try and clean it up a bit. I would highly encourage you guys to go and explore this one a little bit, uh, see some videos on YouTube and see if you can get some more pointers. Yeah, Lynn, what? I was just noticing that when you've got that arm up there and then you drop down, that arm stays there. Yep. Whereas a couple of us, it kind of starts to float back out again. Like, what are you doing to stop it from going out there? Like, so what I'm doing is I'm coming. If I want to make that the angle correction of the elbow, so bring it from low to being in line with the neck. Yep. What I'm actually doing is I'm sinking my ear quite low on the body. Like, really, the lower you can get it, the better. Right now, I'm sort of right near the armpit. Right, I'm even lower on the shoulder. So when you've locked up and you push the head in place and you've done all of this, when my shoulder and my head pushes that arm up, you see how it sort of aligns yeah, the arm? Yeah. And from there, you sink your hips and your head quite low and you turn into him. That's turning turning the head. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like driving into him and turning his neck to the side, which squishes his head into the other side arm. Uh, so I, I would try that. If it still doesn't work, that's... Uh, let's workshop a bit. Cool. Uh, How does everyone feel about that? That's a lot of stuff. Uh, does anybody have any more questions? Awesome. Alrighty. Well, let's get into some rolls then. Uh, I, if you guys want to start in a scarf position and roll from there, maybe it would be beneficial, but it's free rolls, so you guys do whatever you want. Uh, cool. Hope everyone enjoyed that.